so maybe we can go to next the um what it is that structures our conscious experience you know um in terms of you, you touched on this very briefly earlier i think in terms of evolution how that tells us that we don't perceive reality as it is so i've been looking at evolution by natural selection to see what it says about our perceptions and and reality and and most of us intuitively including many of my colleagues most of most of us intuitively think that of course evolution would shape us to see truths about objective reality right the the intuition is that those of our ancestors who saw reality more accurately would have a competitive advantage over those who saw reality less accurately and so they were more likely to pass on their genes that coded for the more accurate perceptions and so after thousands of generations we can be pretty confident that we're the offspring of those who saw more accurately and so so that our our perceptions are telling us truths about objective reality now no one none of my colleagues um would say that evolution shaped us to see all the truth uh, that, that's clearly not the case, right? We have limits in the, the range of um, frequencies of light that we can see, for example, are very, very narrow from 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers, roughly. So that we, we have a narrow window, but, but the idea is that within that window, we see reality as it is. Now, there, um, there are some brilliant thinkers uh, like Steven Pinker. He has a, a, a wonderful paper um, called, So How Does the Mind Work? that he published, I think, in um, mind and language, br a brilliant paper. And he, he points out five reasons why evolution wouldn't shape us to have true beliefs. So, so there's some, some very, very good work from evolutionary theory, which, which clearly already shows that um, selection pressures aren't uniformly for true beliefs. In fact, there are selection pressures against true beliefs. But there's been a, a feeling like, but for everyday middle-sized objects like tables and chairs and forks and spoons and so forth, um, evolution did shape us to see truths about those things, you know, the distribution of middle-sized objects. And so that's what I've gone after with my colleagues, um, Chetan Prakash, Manish Singh, um, Chris Fields, Brian Marion and Justin Mark, a number of us, um, also Jeff Iverson. We, and what we've discovered is that it's a theorem of evolution by natural selection that the probability is zero that anything that we perceive in our senses reflects the structure of objective reality. The very structure of space-time, in other words, we can prove the structure of space-time itself, according to evolution by natural selection, the probability is zero that that structure tells us anything about the structure of objective reality. That's just a theorem of evolution of natural selection. And for those who are interested, I mean, I've got a paper called Fact, Fiction, and Fitness that just got published um, in the journal Entropy just a couple weeks ago. So if you want to you know, if you want to see the theorems, Fact, Fiction, and Fitness, you can go read it for yourself. Um, I've, I've got a paper in Psychonomic Bulletin and Review um, called The Interface Theory of Perception, where we go into this a little bit less formally. So if people want a less, you know, a less formal, but, but it's, it's a clear theorem of evolution by natural selection. The probability is zero that any of our senses report any truths about the structure of objective reality. It's just clear. And now some, there's a couple of responses that people can have to that. One response is to say, well, and this is a, a, a response that I've gotten from a good friend and, and colleague, uh, Reiner Mausfeld, a brilliant, a brilliant thinker. And he pointed out uh, that there's a lot more to evolution than natural selection. There's, there's genetic drift, there's linkage, there's pleiotropy, there's, there's constraints from the, the, the physical construction of their bodies, you know, the chemistry, the biochemistry that, that we have. And, and that's, uh, the, the role of natural selection may be relatively minor um, in, in evolutionary processes. And you know, that's a big debate among professional evolutionary theorists about what is the, the extent of the role of natural selection, how much of it is just due to genetic drift and linkage and so forth. Um, and I don't know the answer to that question about the relative role of, of natural selection, but I don't need to because the arguments that are given why we see the truth from evolution are always based on fitness. 
It makes you more fit to see more of the truth. That's the natural selection argument. No one argues that genetic drift will make you see the truth. No one argues that linkage and pleiotropy will make you see the truth. There's no way that they could. The only feature of evolutionary theory that could possibly do the job is natural selection. And so that's why I focused on that one feature, natural selection. And we use the tools of evolutionary game theory. So I mean, for a lot of people might not know that, that Darwin's theory has been turned into precise mathematics. John Maynard Smith, a British genius in the 70s, um, figured out how to do it. And it's a, a well-established branch of mathematics. So we used evolutionary game theory tools to actually first run simulations to see if I was on the right track. And the simulations showed that if you saw the truth, you went extinct when you competed against creatures that didn't see the truth and were just tuned to fitness. And so then I worked with mathematicians to actually prove, prove a theorem. So it's a clear theorem of evolution of a natural selection using the tools of evolutionary game theory and combinatorial. Actually, we can even go deeper in, in, and use combinatorics to show that the very structure of the fitness payoff functions themselves erases information about the structure of the world. Since we're tuned to fitness payoffs, and those payoffs almost surely erase all information about the structure of the world, we couldn't possibly be tuned to the structure of the world. Now, here's another objection. You're using evolutionary theory to disprove physicalism, right? Space and time and physical, but, but evolutionary theory assumes physicalism. It assumes that DNA exists. It assumes that organisms in space and time exist. So this is, this, it, it can't possibly be right because you're using evolution to disprove evolution. You're shooting yourselves in the foot. This is the logical error. This is a stupid logical error. And that's the power of evolutionary game theory. What evolutionary game theory does is it pulls out the algorithmic core of Darwin's idea. Evolution by natural selection is fundamentally about strategies and competition among strategies. His theory at the core does not require auxiliary assumptions about physicalism, about space and time. It can just look at competition of strategies. So to its credit, evolutionary theory is powerful enough. It's a good enough scientific theory to actually be able to shoot down false auxiliary assumptions like space, time, and physical objects are fundamental. It's that, that's the power of these scientific theories. And it can do it without shooting itself in the foot logically. Now, one thing that another objection would be, <clears throat> Well, what about our abilities in math and logic? Does evolution of natural selection say that our abilities in math and logic are, are, are also completely faulty? If so, then, then we do have a, a logical contradiction. And the interesting thing is that it doesn't. The argument that I give um, for taking down our perceptions of space and time and physical objects as not being a, objective reality does not apply to other cognitive faculties like our ability to do math mathematical reasoning and logic. Those, we have to look at every cognitive capacity on its own terms. You can't go broad brush. And it turns out that there are obvious selection pressures to have some capacity for math and logic. Uh, an organism that doesn't understand that two bites of an apple give you roughly twice the fitness payoff of one bite of an apple is not going to be as fit as one that does. And so we need to reason about fitness payoffs logically. Again, I'm not saying there's selection pressures for us to be mathematical geniuses or logical geniuses. Most of us have a hard time balancing our checkbooks. But, but there will, there's not a uniform selection pressure against math, you know, some competence in logic and mathematics, whereas evolutionary theory makes it very, very clear there's a uniform selection pressure against any perception of truth in terms of space and time and the structure of our senses. There it's uniform, not in math and logic. So, so th these kinds of objections, of course, are very, very smart objections. They're, they're very, they're, they're, they're deep objections, but it turns out that they don't hold.